Broadcasting from Salisbury University campus, this is WSDL Ocean City, NPR News Talk 90.7. Putting Delmarva first. Stay tuned for Delmarva Today with your host, Don Rush. We live in an age of contradictions, the ease of life at home and the cost of war abroad. Welcome to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. The daily ease with which we move through the world, the first world that is, tends to hide the harshness beyond our own immediacy. Jane Satterfield has explored those contradictions in her poetry in Apocalypse Mix, winner of the Autumn House Poetry Prize, and she's received numerous awards for her work. And since April is National Poetry Month, we have her in our studio this morning. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So before we actually get into the meat of things, um, I ran across, I think it's a quote, says, why I don't write nature poems. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about why that is. And, what, I, what, and what, what is it that attracts you about the kind of thing that you are writing about? That's, that's a great question. Um, the poem t that's titled Why I Don't Write Nature Poems was written at the Virginia Center for Creative Arts, which is a wonderful um, uh, artist colony. And uh, when I arrived, a fiction writer said to me, like, oh, I guess you're going to be one of those poets who writes about the cows that are in the fields. Um, and I said, actually, no, I don't write nature poems. So... Um, uh, the first thing that you do as a poet to say that you don't do something then becomes exactly what you do. And after I wrote the poem about not writing nature poems, I began to be very interested in exploring um, the non-human world. Mm, okay. So uh, turning to, uh, to the book that we just referenced, um, tell me a little bit about it the theme that you seem to be exploring. There's a lot of images on the one hand, as I indicate, sort of the ease of, of life here at home, but then conflict in particular seems to then come back into, uh, into your poems. That's a good question. Um, my dad was um, in the Air Force when I was young, um, and then he became um, a reservist. So we lived in uh, near Andrews Air Force Base um, when I was young and later in Frederick, Maryland. Um, and so I think the sense of uh, military culture um, and the presence of war um, was always a sort of background to my life, and I was struck by the contrast between uh, the way that um, there are soldiers um, who give their give their lives um, for for our freedoms and our way of life, and um, they're asked to take tremendous sacrifices. They leave families, their families make sacrifices, but then um, sometimes wars go on, and the populace at large is kind of blind to them, and and sometimes blind to the effects. But at the same time, the experience of war and the language of war like resonates beyond the battlefield, and so often we use metaphors of war when we're just talking about um, everyday experiences like uh, dealing with our colleagues or dealing with our, our family members. So um, I was wanted to look at the way that um, we kind of turn a blind eye to some of those conflicts. Do you find that to be especially true these days? I mean, the, the United States is actually, well involved, at least in one war, was involved in two with, right. from, over the years. Um, went on. Some of what people have said is that uh, because we have an all-volunteer army, a very small percentage actually goes and fights, as opposed to, say, for instance, Vietnam, where you had a, um, the, the draft, which pulled all, lots of people in. What do you make of that moment in time that we're now living through, where we have this contrast? That's a that was very much a part of um, what was behind Apocalypse Mix because when I was you know raising my daughter, um, one of the things at schools we were often asked to bring in you know chocolate bars or bring in right. <laughs> you know like uh, a towelettes or things that could be sent overseas and the students would write cheerful messages and it was somehow somehow it seemed as though we did our job in in recognizing um, what they what they were doing. Um, so so for me I wanted. To to um, start to pay attention a little bit more. So you make reference, I think, to the Great War. Um, I think it's a, it's a bestiary for a centenary. I yes, hope that's yes, I pronounced absolutely. it right. Absolutely. Um, and uh, in it, you talk about what are innocent creatures, amongst other things. The pigeons, for instance, no one recruited them as with posters or trips abroad, obligations to protect honor or the golden opportunity to earn as, <laughs> right. as you learn. Why did you decide to pick particularly some of those animals who obviously are participating in a war that 
they know nothing about. Well, it's interesting. There was a feature in The Atlantic, um, I believe, in, uh, I think, um, 2016, that was a photo essay about the animals in World War One, And I was, I don't think I had ever until that point um, seen the extent of how, how, technologically the first world war was very different um, from other wars and so um, the idea that you know dogs might be running out and and laying um, and helping people lay um, telegraph wire lines the idea that pigeons were relied on for messaging um, which is fascinating to think about in the culture of instant messaging right and the way that um, our systems of communication are different but I, I felt that uh, the more I began to look at the images of the animals and to learn more about how animals um, were were put into service um, as beasts of burden and more, um, I, it, it sort of became a way of looking at the economy of war and the way in which um, war is an industry and to, to start to ask questions about who profits from from that industry. I was a reminder that, that there was a film a few years back called War Horse. Right, right, absolutely. In which you see, in which you see a horse who goes through a series of individuals who die during the war itself. I mean, yeah. And one thing that was um, the other day, I had the opportunity to visit um, a class that Adam Tavel, um, another uh, Salisbury poet. Um, is teaching at uh, Warwick Community College, and there was three veterans in his class, and they were um, they wanted to talk about that poem because it really resonated for them the idea of um, people being sent to war without really having um, power to make decisions. They found it very moving, which was rewarding for me to hear. Now, the other thing, by the way, towards the end of the film, uh, poem, I think you talk about that which is left behind. You talk about in farmlands, forests, and crater ground. Munitions and bones of missing men keep turning up. Um, and that was actually struck me because I remember uh, going to Germany and taking, I guess it's the Autobahn, down right. through uh, into uh, into uh, Belgium and looking off to the side, and there was an off-ramp for the Ardennes Forest, which, of course, was the major yes. uh, highway, as it were, of a forest where the, the Germans during the Second World War funneled through. And I think remember thinking to myself that the forest has now been reduced to an off ramp, right, right, and and certainly the the effect of battle and all the shelling um, did destroy farmlands. And there are, I think, as I mentioned in the poem, some cities were some um, towns were wiped off the map, um, never to never to exist again, just because of the sheer um, destruction of the of the shelling. And I think um, that's a very, I think it's important for us to remember. It's a very powerful warning. And also struck by the idea that uh, as we see conflicts around the globe, um, war leaves its aftermath in the forms of things like mines and so on, and even the kids Absolutely. suffer. Absolutely. So um, I think it's important to think about the soldier's perspective, but certainly the effects on civilians are, are equally destructive. And, and certainly um, the toxic legacy of um, shells and munitions that are buried in the ground, that's a that's a issue, I think, for um, people to think about. You also have another poem, uh, Radio Clash. Yes. In which, uh, tell me a little bit about the inspiration for this. That was a poem that I was asked to contribute a poem to an anthology called London Calling, um, which was a celebration um, of the, I think, the 40th anniversary of the Clash's album, London Calling. And it was put together by two poets, Jerry LaFemina and Greg Wilhelm. And um, so I decided to, I said, OK, well, what's my memory of the Clash? And I wanted to write about the experience of um, being in the grocery store and hearing um, uh, sort of the clashes, kind of like background music compared to music that was very alive and very new when I was a young person. And so, and, and in it, you seem to indicate that this, this music is an attempt in some fashion, or at least sort of to keep at bay. Um, the images that that you create uh, when you talk about war. I mean, I think it's a, lot, it's a couple of lines where you said, "What couldn't uh, punk do if not make things burn a little brighter?" Beat back images burned on a brain pans, strafe of jets against the sky, foliate walls of f flame, and families bunkered down. There was like this, as if the music were keeping away that that reality. I. Think, or did I to interpret it right? I think that I would say, well, for me, the po the 
music of The Clash was some of the uh, really inspirational in terms of the way they took on issues and questions of social justice. Um, and certainly one thing that was fascinating about punk music it was about truth telling. And I kind of latched on to that, I think. It's something that's very important to me as a poet. When I was younger, I was struck by the work of um, Wilfred Owen, um, who's a very powerful voice in telling like it is about war. And I, I found that same kind of impulse um, in The Clash, and so it was important for me to kind of think through those issues in the poem. So the music is a kind of like resistance in some ways, a kind of celebration of life and uh, an articulation um, that in some ways there are aspects of life that we're not told the truth about, but we must find the words to tell the truth and break the silence, I guess. Do you think that art, whether it's uh, whether it's music or it's poetry, is doing that today? I think it is. Um, one thing that's fascinating is there's so many young people who are interested in poetry and also very interested in spoken word poetry um, and that idea of being able to um, open up a door, um, not just in terms of their own self-expression, but to share experiences and stories uh, about experiences that have been sometimes um, worthy of celebration and sometimes things that you're calling people out on. The other thing to do is, as you indicate, uh, another poem with a baby carriage and so on um, mm. incident in which you seem to be talking about the shape, how war and conflict shape us here at home. And, and, and it's particularly, I, I don't know if it's necessary that it was too specific to London in particular, or to, to, but, but you give the sense that the, how war changes us and maybe separates us. Yeah, so Triptych is a little bit of a time travel poem. Um, I saw a photograph of protesters in London outside of the um, outside of the British Embassy, and I couldn't help but thinking of the day that I visited the embassy um, to get a passport for my daughter. She was born in England, um, and so she's both a British citizen and an American citizen, and so to uh, fill out the paperwork for that, we were at the embassy, and I was kind of thinking about how much had changed over the course um, of of the 20 or so years um, since I visited and I had an encounter, just a very brief encounter, with a Muslim woman who did not speak English very well, but she came up and approached me and um, was uh, sort of admiring uh, my daughter and, and, you know, rubbing her hand along her face, um, just in this, you know, um, sort of woman to woman. Um, embrace of the beauty of life and and the joy in in having children and um, it was it was a very powerful memory that stuck with me um, for many years and it wasn't until I saw that photograph um, that I was able to access um, the energy for the poem. So, so do you think? Uh, how does war then divide us? Do you think? Um, I think we're divided, sometimes very literally, by putting boundaries up. There's places that we can't travel to or we don't go, and I think it creates emotional divisions between people, and certainly um, the poem Triptych. Um, when we're engaged in wars, we are literally taking sides, and so we begin to sort of dehumanize people and, and, and you know, break the world down into us and them, um, which is a very destructive way of thinking that that breaks down our humanity and ability to work together for the common good and you you asked this question about how to speak of what we share what separates us if there's a woman in the crowd i don't see her right what are you asking for there so in that photograph it was a group of male protesters and i was just trying to imagine how had that woman um who i had that brief encounter with how had her life transformed in ways today would i be able to have that kind of exchange or would the sort of backdrop of war and the fear that we have of others, the, the sort of sense that someone might be a terrorist, um, that that is troublesome, um, would that stop people from communicating to it from, with each other? You also have a, a, a slightly different thing, but perhaps uh, connected, which is uh, crossing the Shenandoah in yes. late summer. Tell me about that poem and the contrast or the, the question that I think that you're asking. In that, that's another poem where I'm asking about the divisions and the ways in which we define people in terms of groups. And it's a poem that looks at, it looks at the legacy of racism um, in, in Maryland. Um, and uh, that was a, a poem, I think it was probably the first time I, I saw 
um, outside of a history book, a Confederate flag. And so the poems, you know, looking at what it was like to be a young person and say, why is this there? What does this mean? What am I learning about the world? Um, so when you saw it, what was your impression? Did you think much about it at, I, the, at the moment? At or? the moment, I just wondered, you know, usually you see, um, I had seen up until that point, I was a teenager, um, images of the Confederate flag in, in a textbook in the context of a discussion, a uh, history lesson, let's say, about the Civil War. So the idea that it was um, sort of material for a bumper sticker that might, or, or a flag that might be flown in someone's car as a um, emblem of identity um, was a little bit puzzling to me. And you write it, and you said, uh, I guess you asked a question about pride and heritage and liberty, you ask, or am I staring at an open secret? What do you mean by that? Right, and I think what I mean is that um, sometimes we turn, we often turn away from our history, the history that's underfoot. We turn away from um, our own, the legacy um, of our country. Um, sometimes we look at the moments that are certainly worth celebrating, um, that we should be um, proud of, and sometimes we sweep things under the rug. And I think that poem is, I'm trying to think about that subject. So when, what do you, given that poem and that observation, what do you make about events then today? Well, in Baltimore, um, we had uh, several, uh, Baltimore is a very divided city, and so it is, I think, most poets feel like there is it's our responsibility in some way to think about how do we break down those divisions and how do we come to terms with the legacy um, of slavery and the legacy of injustices um, that that society can perpetuate. What do you make of the political dialogue that we're seeing that seems much sharper than I think it's been in quite some time? But. Yes, sharper than I think I would remember in my lifetime. Um, and I remember growing up reading, um, you know, learning about Watergate through right. <laughs> what was the, the, How quaint. Through the, the, the uh, you know, cartoons. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it seems like a very different time. Um, but that inability, I think, to be civil, to look from, from uh, at different points of view, to kind of speak to one another as individuals. And one of the things that's very powerful that poetry can do is poetry is sort of the repository of our stories. And so it allows us to hear multiple voices. So do, do, I say read more poetry. <laughs> <laughs> as, a, as a solution, right? Right, right. Oh, do you think we are listening to one another, or do you think we're not? I think there's pockets where people are. Um, I was at uh, uh, my neighborhood, um, you know, block party. We have a block party maybe uh, sometimes twice a year, sometimes once a year. And, you know, one of my neighbors said to me, now, um, it's an election year. Don't talk politics. Over there and over there and over there. Um, they're not on our side. You know, so there we are with that metaphor of war, our side, their side. Um, and so it was refreshing that we just took politics off the table. Um, and so I think when people can do that, um, there are times when political discussions are necessary, but I think there's times when we should take them off the table and that we might try to listen to each other. Um, it's very hard, it's easy to talk and hard to listen. Do you think there's an underlying um, emotional division and resentments that we're seeing that just simply coming to the fore? That most, I think, social I mean, scientists. always been there. Yeah. Um, I teach um, in the. Uh, I work with um, faculty um, on the peace and justice minor and curriculum at um, Loyola, and so some of my colleagues in social sciences would definitely say that that's the case. Um, but I think that um, I. I think there's moments where people are, are more open. For example, um, there's a great deal. Women are coming forward um, telling their stories. Um, survivors are coming forward and telling their stories about um, sexual harassment. And it's important that we create the spaces for people to be able to tell their stories and for others to listen. Um, because I think that dialogue of um, telling stories and listening to each other becomes a way that we can start to move toward action. Do you think part of the problem is that we have difficulty in coming to grips as a nation with the kinds of changes that we're seeing? Obviously, there's the demographic change, but mm -hmm. there's also cultural changes as well, That that and that creates this friction between various 
groups of people? Well, there's so much that's changing so fast. There's also the pace of technology, um, which puts news in people's faces 24 hours a day um, with a kind of intensity that is not the equivalent of seeing a newspaper dropped on your doorstep, right? So everything's so fast-paced. Um, I think people become revved up um, by they can become revved up by um, sound bites that are played over and over, and certainly Twitter um, sort of is like <laughs> stirring the pot in some ways, although Twitter has. So the technology has this wonderful power to connect people, but also a power to divide people. So I think that's one thing that, that we're facing. And then there's certainly things like you mentioned, demographic changes and generational changes. And there is also, um, I think there's climate change too. Like we're seeing tremendous storms and we don't quite know um, what are the forces behind it. Things are happening so rapidly. I think it makes people nervous and want to hold on to the way things have always been in a kind of like wave of nostalgia. I think it's a human impulse not, not to fear change. Uh, speaking of climate change, are you going to write about it at all? Or have you written about it already? I'm writing a little bit about it in the book that I'm working on right mm -hmm. now. Um, just began writing about uh, sort of the non-human perspective in my local neighborhood. And then I think inevitably that leads you to look at, look at the changes that you see both in your small area and your state and then to begin to look larger. Yeah, because I mean, Ryan, in fact, I just finished uh, reading, I said, The Uninhabitable Earth, I think, has just, just come out, which talks about all the various scenarios and right. things that are going on. And it, it seems, I was reminded of a song that was written, actually, back in the early 1960s about what was then the existential crisis, which was nuclear war. Right, right. Now, it's it looks as if it's climate change, and unlike that, which back in the 1960s could be controlled... Perhaps this is not so much. Right, and it's hard It's hard for us to, and reports keep coming out that the pace is accelerating or that it's bigger than, than we might understood or have measured. Um, so I think that does create a sense of anxiety. I know when I've talked to students um, about the things that they fear the most, many of my students will say climate change because they're looking, um, we're sort of on, on, on our way out, <laughs> which really? is one of the most difficult things about being human, right? right? But thinking about the legacy that we leave to younger generations, they're, they're sort of asking that. They're sort of asking questions. Are, are, we, are we the last generation? And that's a very painful um, question, I think, for young people to ask. And certainly, having grown up in an era where the threat of nuclear war was very near, um, I think students are also feeling that again. One of Tara Elliott's students at Salisbury Middle School, um, just sort of when they were writing a post-apocalyptic postcard, one of the students said, I'm terrified of war and nuclear war. And that was a comment that I don't think I've heard um, uh, young people um, bringing up since maybe, I don't know, like maybe the late 80s. Right, you know? right. So that, that definitely is a little bit in the air, sadly. So more poetry. More poetry. <laughs> Uh, finally, I want to uh, end up talking about and uh, returning to war, um, special screening, which um, well, tell me a little bit about what you were doing here. I guess it's and it's based in part on uh, screening of the Black Hawk Down. So I had the good fortune for a number of years. Um, Mark Bowden was a writer in residence at Loyola, and he was in my department, so I could sort of walk by, walk by his door, say hello. Um, and he was teaching journalism, and so when that book came out, we had the opportunity to have a private screening, um, and I was able to take my dad, um, which was a big deal for him because he had read the book and was um, admired uh, the work that, that Bowden had done to talk about how that particular mission went wrong and some of the challenges that those on the ground face. Um, so it was a very moving experience for my dad to go through the line, shake the reporter's hand, um, and I wanted to write about that poem, but it was interesting because I was sort of taking it in as, as a literary event, and my dad was sitting next to me sort of finding all the little faults in the movie <laughs> in terms of like what technical things in terms of 
of the gear. Like that wasn't the, you know, exact kind of, you know, boots that people wore at that particular moment. Because right. he had been called up as a reservist during um, the era of, of Desert Storm. So that, um, you know, the military paraphernalia and so on were, were very clear to him. And I wouldn't have noticed that. So I had my personal, like, fact checker with me. And it was just a very, very sort of sweet moment, I think, um, where I was able to, where it sort of take my dad to some part of my life that also was a window on his world. And, and you mentioned that, that you mentioned that uh, after it's over, I guess, uh, some of us still stockpile Cipro, we toast a season of good cheer and a new year, right. as if, okay, now we go on with it, even though there are Blackhawks down, as it were, going on, even as we speak, say, for instance, in a place like Afghanistan. Right. And that moment, of course, the, it's shortly after 9-11, um, and so there's a great deal of fear at that particular moment about what would unfold, and things unfolded in ways that are very different than we imagined. Like, we, we feared, um, I think, the, the there was a smallpox. Um, in the anthrax, anthrax Sam, yes, right. yes, the anthrax, that's what I meant. Yeah. Um, and so people were sort of stockpiling Cipro as a way to uh, deal with the fear of bi bioterrorism, but we had other um, things to deal with. And certainly I've invited um, that uh, veteran writer, um, Dario Di Battista, to speak to my students a few times. He's edited an anthology called Retire the Colors, which is about the experiences of um, men and women who have fought in Afghanistan and Iraq. And um, students find it very moving because they, they often uh, feel very cut off from um, the, the military. There's a divide between, I think, civilian culture and military culture, sometimes for good reasons, other times because um, it's too painful to connect with, with people who are undergoing experiences that are, that are so traumatic and profound on our behalf. I think it's hard um, for, for the average person to kind of connect. I know, as a matter of fact, we uh, did a story, I think it was last year, uh, about a couple of veterans who had, had tours both in Iraq and Afghanistan, right. uh, and they both suffered from uh, the post-traumatic stress disorder right. uh, and things like they said when they came home uh, one of them said that they didn't like going through doors right absolutely and there's um, a number of poets um, terrific uh, poets uh, who are vets um, Brian Turner is is one who's wonderful in his book um, I think came out in two, 2005 called um, Phantom Noise and it's about the experience of PTSD there's another wonderful poet Seth Brady Tucker um, who fought in, who was in the um, first uh, Gulf War, and he has a ter terrific sets of stories and books. So there are, it's a, one of the, I would say one of the, um, I guess you could call it a, a boon um, from the experience of war is that we, that it's a b boon to literature in some ways. So many people are writing um, beautifully about the experiences um, of war and the ways in which it transforms both individual and national consciousness. In fact, I mean, one of the things that has struck me, particularly uh, looking at, for instance, the aftermath of the First World War II, is that there are people who come to grips with and write about these experiences um, and have oftentimes an impact on the social yes, side in which yes. they, they live. I think that's what we hope that poems will do. We'll have some, um, they'll resonate with readers, but they'll also sort of spark in some ways social change. Well, we've been speaking with Jane Satterfield. She um, has her book, uh, Apocalypse Mix, uh, which is a winner of the Autumn House Poetry Prize. Obviously, lots of other awards, which you don't need to mention, I guess. Thank you. And this discourse is uh, the April National Poetry Month. We wanted to at least get you in and chat about some of the work that you've oh, been doing. Oh, it's fabulous. National Poetry Month is, is always a terrific celebration of poetry. And we have our national poet, Tracy poet laureate Tracy K. Smith, um, who's who's really a terrific poet and, and really sort of energizing uh, the poetry world. And I guess locally we're going to have, uh, Salisbury will have um, its first poet laureate, which will be announced this week. So that's very exciting too. That's right. Spread the good poetry gospel. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, we've been speaking with Jane Satterfield. Appreciate you stopping by and chatting oh, with us. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. This has been Del Marva Today. I'm Don Rush. Thanks for listening. Thank you for watching Delmarva Today, a production of Delmarva Public Radio. Production and audio engineering by Chris Rank. Hosted by Don Rush. <laughs>
For podcasts, visit DelmarvaPublicRadio.net or subscribe to the Delmarva Today podcast on iTunes. Delmarva Today can now be seen on Pack 14.